Hello, designers, and welcome to Adobe Live. I'm your host, Julian Crespo, joining you from sunny San Francisco. Uh, and today I have the pleasure of sitting down with the very talented Sarah Gear, product designer and lover of plants and animals and design and all things amazing. <laughs> so, and hello, Hi, ev <laughs> hello, everybody in the chat joining us. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Uh, we would love to know where you are joining us from. Uh, and if you are joining us on YouTube, why don't you head over to Behance, uh, log in and join the conversation. Um, that would be the best way for us to engage with you. So we'd love to know where you're joining us from, uh, that, all that good stuff. So um, today, let's take a look at the schedule, what we have lined up for today. We have a full day planned. Uh, so 7.30, we started with uh, designing mock-ups with Julia, uh, Photoshop Daily Challenge with the, the wonderful Voodoo Val, uh, drawing and painting with Kevin Kwong, at 11.30, we had uh, day, the Illustration Daily Challenge with Andrew uh, Hockadrell, which is amazing, great, great stuff there. Today, obviously, we have the mobile app design with your very, your very truly, uh, very Sarah Gear, and recently married, so congratulations on that. Uh, and then at two o'clock after this, we're gonna have the XD Daily Creative Challenge with uh, Peter Del Tondo. I uh, highly recommend you looking into that. And uh, 2.30, we're gonna have the Doodle Therapy. So please join us the whole day, keep us in your background, engage. Um, and then just let me introduce you to today's uh, daily creative challenge. Uh, we're going to be focusing on interactions. So uh, you can find all those details uh, right there above the chat just by clicking the challenge tab. Um, and they're going to be you're going to be continuing a, a challenge from previous week where you're pushing your designs into a new direction with interactions. So definitely take part in that and uh, be sure to join the Discord channel for that as well to engage with your audience uh, and the community at large. Um, we also will an hour and a half into our stream. We will have uh, the uh, the Behance uh, artist spotlight. So be sure to uh, let us know if you'd like to be featured, or if you can recommend other people who want to be featured in the chat. Uh, check out the spotlight tab, and if you have any other questions, our moderators can help you with that as well. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's introduce you to Sarah Gear, and uh, and we'd love to know more about you. So what are we going to be doing today? Awesome. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Sarah, super, super excited to be here um, and we'll be designing a mobile app for plants today, um, but I'll start off with just a little intro about myself for anybody who doesn't know me. Uh, my name is Sarah, I'm a designer, dog mom, plant enthusiast and science nerd. Uh, I am based out in the South Bay uh, in San Carlos, and you can find me at my handle at Sarah Gear underscore um, on basically all of my social medias. Uh, so if you're curious on, you know, follow me along with my design journey after this, uh, you can always catch me on Twitter or Instagram, um, especially around plants. I'm usually posting about plants there. Um, so like I said, I am a very proud dog mom of three wonderful pets. Uh, this is a little photo of them that we did for a Christmas card last year. Um, it's not easy to take a photo of three dogs. Oh. <laughs> uh, had to do a little photoshopping here to make this look good. Um, oh. But uh, we have two rescues, Denji, he's a Jack Russell, he's 12. Chloe, she's a mix. We did one of those doggy DNA tests and like, she turned out to be like a Pomeranian, a Lab, a uh, Great Pyrenees, like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> she's five. And then we have little Milo, who's one years old. He's a long-haired dachshund. Um, and if you love dogs or need more positivity oh. and dog feed in your Instagram, uh, you could find them over here. <laughs> my first my first dog was a dachshund. Actually, my only dog ever was a dachshund. So I oh, really? <laughs> Yo, love dachshunds. They're the best. <laughs> yeah, I agree. They have such a personality. Very, very spunky little guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then a little about me and, um, you know, my journey into becoming a designer. Um, originally, actually, I was within like the healthcare profession. Um, I have a 
a bachelor's in biology, was studying pharmacy, and I eventually entered into the route of design through healthcare, um, looking at digital applications uh, for big ho hospital associations, um, and eventually kind of fell in love with design um, for the mere fact of, you know, making an impact and a change through, you know, digital experiences. Uh, so, you know, something I always love to talk about is like, you know, my journey through being a career switcher. So if anybody is in that kind of position right now or has any questions, you know, feel free to ask throughout the next two days or you could always reach out to me on a social media or my email as well. Yeah, I, I'm the same way, by the way, I, I switched my career late as well. So I'm in the same in the same field as you. Yeah, no, I always think that it brings a, a little bit of an outside of the box perspective when designing, which sure. I think is super, super valuable. Um, and then some news from for this year, um, you know, been freelancing for about three years and I joined forces with a really good friend of mine, Katie Atherholt, wonderful brand and visual designer. Uh, and we created our own des uh, design firm called Moss, uh, where we're focusing on healthcare and wellness. Uh, so we're kind of bringing in our um, and merging our skill set of, you know, brand identity with product and kind of hoping to make a change within the healthcare and wellness space um, around design. So definitely keep an eye out for us as we will be launching next year. Right. And then why we're here today is plants. You know, I absolutely love them. I have about 80 plants at my place right now, I think with quarantine and everything, I went from like 20 or 30 and like, it just went out of control. It's just been super therapeutic. You know, I have like a Monstera here. Um, there's like a philodendron mic gans that I really love. Uh, and then I have my prayer plants, which are like one of my favorite ones because of the way that they, the leaves move. Yeah. Uh, which is super, super fun. Uh, and then I have this one, an alocasia dora, that's just kind of wild. It just keeps growing and growing. Do they, um, have, and are they, do they have babies? Like, are you propagating them too? I have propagated a few of them. Um, Katie, my friend, actually ends up being uh, the mother of all of them and adopting them because I just don't have enough space. Yeah. Um, but I have successfully propagated uh, a, a few of my marantas, actually. And awesome. Milo is always like my little helper here um, when right. it comes to potting. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so with that, uh, we'll be going into building a plant app. Right. Um, and hello, everybody so that's joining us. We have Nix, we got Iman, we got uh, Rachel. Hello from Iowa. We have uh, Richard Cisneros from Chicago. Uh, I lived in Chicago for a long time, so hello. Uh, it's good yep. to see you there. Voodoo Val holding it down. Uh, Lindsay, uh, we have Jose Escalante from Los Cabos. Uh, uh, Katie, there's a, so many people are here joining us today. I just want you to know that we got a large audience that is just waiting for your your plant therapy. Um, so <laughs> there, there's a few questions in there, and we'll, we'll get we'll get to some of those questions in a little bit. But yeah, let's let's dive into the plant. Yeah, for sure. Well, hopefully everybody's a fan of plants, or you know, just starting out. Um, I will say I am no expert and that's kind of what um, inspired me to, you know, build a mobile app around plants today. Um, one of the biggest things is especially with those finicky plants is just understanding, you know, like what, you know, the moisture level, then there's like the soil nutrients and uh, the humidity for those like humidity loving plants and then the sun. There's a lot of variables when it comes to taking care of your plant. And aside from like understanding and basically talking to your plant um, and seeing the signs and symptoms of it, you know, it'd be pretty cool if there was some sort of gadget that like, you know, you throw into the soil that measures all of this. Right. Um, so, you know, what I'm trying to solve here today is just kind of focusing on like a tech savvy plant parent that wants a mobile tool that allows them to track and maintain their plant while even maybe even keeping it as like an inventory of, you know, all the plants you might have, you know, if you have like 80 plus like me. Um, because right now there aren't that many options or like there's various different tools. You have to maybe create your own notion. I've seen some people do uh, to, you know, keep track of all these things. 
So I ended up kind of doing a little bit of research. Um, my background is in science. I naturally like to do my research. Um, it was a very easy transition in that sense because I was able to use my background in science and asking all those questions to apply to you know the UX and research of design. Um, so I actually did find a gadget online. Yeah. Um, it's from North. It looks like this. You just kind of stick it into the soil. Um, you you can pair it. I think it was up to like five thousand plants. Oh. Um, but you'd obviously have to like move it around. Or if you want, I think it was like twenty thirty dollars. You'd have to buy multiple, which Ooh, I can get that's pricey. a little that's steep if yeah. you have a lot of plants. You have eighty plants. That's that's uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's big... I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? that's a big chunk of change. Yeah. Um. So I tested it out with like, you know, one of my plants just to see what it looks like. You know, this is the interface that it has right now. I'll zoom in a little bit more so y'all can see. Um, and I tried it with one of my peperomias. First thing that I noticed was just kind of like the options. Not every plant was basically like listed there. Like this was a variegated version of it versus like a normal one that I might have. Cause sometimes the variegated uh, ones have different needs. And then it was just super, super simple, not robust in the way that of what I was looking for. And then even when you'd look at like the data visualization of these metrics, it was kind of lacking. Yeah. Um, what was nice is that they do give, for instance, um, a deeper dive into what a plant's origin and, you know, more information, which was really cool. Um, but, you know, it was still lacking. There was pairing issues, even like connectivity, like for signing in sometimes would work and won't work some, uh, it would work and wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was just still, you know, a little bit, it felt like this could this experience could be enhanced a little bit. So I was hoping that, you know, maybe today we can all do that. Great. Another one that I use all the time, it's one of my favorite ones from like an inventory kind of perspective is Planta. Mm -hmm. um, to my knowledge, it's iOS only because I had a friend of mine was interested and she has an Android and was like, I can't download it. Mm. Um, so that's like another constraint. So not all users can get on this. Um, but a cool thing about it was it will give you like reminders. So in case I forget which it happens, it will give me a right. nudge about like, you should check on your plants, which I really liked. Yeah. So you can put sites, um, the different plants you might have, and then photos as well. So right. here's my proof that I have 80 plants. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what's, what's the, like your, your maintenance like on it? Do, do you like maintain this app quite a bit? Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, because I've noticed when I've forgotten, like my plants are not happy and I'll have like, I would say about half of them, like 40 and 40 are about like around the same watering schedule. Um, it'll even remind you to miss them, um, fertilize them, repot them. It reminds you to do a lot of things, which is like really, really, really nice. Right. Um, That's cool. So Yeah. So... Let's see. Oh, and then like, I didn't picture it here, but some other cool features it has, it has like a plant identity type of um, aspect to it where you can take a photo of your plant and it'll tell you, or it can give you, you know, uh, educated guess based off of the leaves right. and stuff, you know, what kind of plant it is, right. which is also really nice. Some little like light machine learning or something in there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So with that, you know, looking over those two uh, different uh, options, I was like, okay, how can we kind of merge and combine, you know, the whole metrics and health of your plant from like a live type of feed perspective with um, the inventory aspects that I like with Planta. Uh, so usually the way I'll kind of go through these uh, next two days is kind of going through it as if, you know, we're building this from scratch and, you know, you y'all can be the stakeholder, you know, tell me things that you'd want to see in it. Um, and we could go from there. I put together already a little bit of like a mood board of like ideas of the direction that we could go with that. Um, more from like a boho type of chic perspective um, where we could use a lot more natural colors um, that will, you know, hit against contrast really well with greens and whatnot. 
Nice, that's awesome. And uh, so there's a question about like, how can people find you and follow you? Uh, do you have like an Instagram or uh, do you have uh, like some sort of network where people can find you? Yeah, so whoop, right here, uh, at Sarah Gear underscore. Um, that, like everywhere? Literally everywhere. Nice, nice. There <laughs> the you go. underscore is helpful. Yeah, the underscore is helpful to be able to get that same handle everywhere. So um, you could find me literally Twitter, Instagram, Dribble and Behance um, nice. at uh, Sarah Gear underscore. Yeah, and there is a there is a question about like advice and like getting into design. Do you want to briefly like um, like how did you like find design and do you have any like tips for new designers who are looking to like break into the field like that is something relatively attainable for them to accomplish? Yeah, I mean, I think anybody from like an attainability perspective, you know, as long as you have that passion um, and I mean this like even outside of design, just in general in life, if you have the passion, just go for it. You know, you kind of just manifest that into the world and um, do what you need to do. So for me, it was like right after pharmacy school, um, all I knew was healthcare. So I went into like um, asso uh, health healthcare associations, like the American Hospital Association, um, and was working within more like a project management standpoint, mm -hmm. where I kind of had to wear many hats, and I was able to experience the different um, areas within, you know, uh, uh, that a project might encompass. So from there, I realized that I really like the design aspect and talking with the customers to find out gaps within the product. Um, and I was just doing a lot of self teaching myself, watching, yeah. you know, Adobe Live like this or mm -hmm. reading articles, um, following some designers on Twitter. Um, and from there, I actually went to a boot camp, which Is kind of accelerated camp. that. Nice. Yeah. So, and I'm actually from the Chicagoland area as well. And I did a boot camp out there called Designation, which it was acquired by Flatiron now. Oh, um, yeah. So That's awesome. I did, yeah, which was nice because it was an apprenticeship style. So it was just kind of forcing you to practice what you're learning. Um, and I would say that'd be the best way to do it. Just find projects, even if you can do something maybe pro bono for like an organization you really like, yeah. um, go for it. But yeah, or friends, anybody who might need some mm -hmm. design work, a website. Uh, yeah. small businesses. Uh, Voodoo Val had a great recommendation and it's something that I've seen a lot of people utilize is the daily creative challenges. Like those those two week courses, like they teach you a lot of the like basics of uh, UX design, interaction design and visual design and how to use a tool. Uh, and then you have a community that can support you as well. So um, also just recommend that. And if you are just joining us, uh, we are joined by uh, Sarah Gear, who is our uh, uh, plant enthusiast, product designer, uh, designing a mobile app with us. So if you have any questions for her, uh, definitely like ask them and I will uh, do my best to make sure she gets that uh, information. So uh, feel free to to just chime into the conversation too. We'd love to know where you're from and uh, what what's going on and, and whatever's on your mind. Uh, so uh, so we're so we're now looking at like your, your mood board, your mm -hmm. visualization. Yeah. So walk us through that. Yeah. So usually when I'm looking for inspiration, so like one thing I always like to do, my number one inspiration that I try to do is just kind of like the outside world. Um, earlier in my career, I love like interior design and like really well thought out like restaurants. Mm. So whenever I'd go to a restaurant and I really like the contrast between like colors and textures, I would take a photo. So I would say like that's the easiest way, just like we have our phones with us all the time, yeah. use it to your advantage, create like a little album that's just kind of like design inspo. And like anytime you see something from even typefaces, anything like that, that inspires you that you really like, even if you're not creating creating anything that very moment, take a photo because it might help you later. Awesome. Um, but if I'm on the fly, you know, I'll usually go to like Behance, um, Pinterest sometimes too, just to, and just start typing things out. I like to focus on kind of the types of feelings I'm trying to invoke in the mm. design that I'm creating. So I would type stuff that I think would invoke that feeling and just kind of look and skim. And when I find images that kind of invoke that, I'll like put it all, to throw it, you know, on my artboard and whatnot. Um, and I'm not looking at color. I'm not looking at anything. It's just literally, it's like, how does this image make me feel? And does it match the goal that you're trying to create with your design? Yeah. Um, 
from there, I will start um, curating the images into what, you know, feels the same. So for instance, here, like I said, I liked that whole boho chic um, vibe just because of the minimalism to it um, that allows for those greens to pop. Mm -hmm. uh, so these were like the images, for instance, that I curated for that. Awesome. Yeah, and in, in the event you are looking for color, uh, Christina had a great uh, tool to, to recommend is Adobe Capture, which is a mobile app that allows you to capture colors. So that's a that's a really cool thing if you are into this space of looking at colors and in the natural world and how to translate that to digital. Um, that's a really cool tool. Yeah, great point out on that. Yeah, definitely. And then from there, so for instance, you know, we'll start going into creating the foundation for what the designs will be. So like the color typography and some of the components like buttons and form fields that you know that will you know, be there for whatever design um, you're creating. So, so right here, I just started a very bare skeleton of, you know, what I'd be needing for um, this specific uh, design. So we'll have like our primary color, our neutrals, usually like the blacks and grays, and then, you know, the status. Mm -hmm. This is especially key for this app because there's going to be points where you need to alert the user that, you know, oh no, your plant needs your help. <laughs> like right. you wanna make sure that um, that occurs. So usually what I'll do is just kind of, you know, Obviously, like you mentioned, the Adobe Capture would be really helpful right now to kind of just start picking colors that we're seeing here um, to kind of uh, start creating our color palette. So for instance, I think like the main color here is obviously going to be green. So kind of looking for, you know, different color greens that we could probably use um, until I guess like we find something that we really like. Um, this one feels a little bit too um, mustardy-ish to me. Yeah, and this is a really, really great way to kind of explore colors, you know, through your inspiration photos. Uh, so for anyone watching uh, that doesn't really know what, what's going on, it's uh, the eyedrop tool is just a really great, simple, widely used tool to just capture color. Um, so then you could kind of just like bring in photos that you'd like and. That's, that's just a really, really great, the way you're doing it is just like a really make sense way of approaching like how to kind of translate color. I myself am like always struggling with color. I feel kind of uh, like I don't see color that, like as, as impactful as most people might. And so like I have to really pay attention at that. So for people that do struggle with what colors to use, um, yeah, this is, this is a, a good start. And then there's other ways you can kind of uh, use services to kind of recommend colors too. Like yeah, Adobe. and I was actually going to bring one up um, from, you know, Adobe. So like, for instance, I, this feels like a really good, like a darker green. Um, so one thing that we can go to, um, I know Adobe Color Wheel has this where you can, you know, we could enter in a oops, hex code and then based on, you know, what type of harmony rule you want to apply, you can go and find colors that like might complement it um as well yeah this is amazing yeah this is something that i use too because i have i have to because i'm the worst at <laughs> finding which colors are as a, like you should be using in the color wheel yeah exactly so like this is like a really great one other ones that you could use coolers is a fun one yeah. as well um that i have used before yeah. i'll show that real quick Yeah. So like, for instance, you can lock the color and then you just can, and this is where like you can go down rabbit holes and I've done yeah. that before where oh, you can just start looking at different like palettes and picking the colors that you think you really like. Right. Um, so it's yeah. Good, so these, it's a good rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But <laughs> you also need, it's a really great time to apply like a Pomodoro and like time box yourself because it can, you can just go down like for hours looking for colors. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, so yeah, so let's see. Um, then finding like, let's see, I'm gonna wanna do something a little bit more of like a neutral maybe. That might be too yellow. 
It's too brown. Um, but yeah, I mean, if anybody else has any um, suggestions on like colors uh, or ways that they find colors that's really helpful, um, that'd be great to hear aside from like the two ones that we just mentioned. I'm, I'm really liking just like that, also the, just like that blush pink that's in the background too. Like, yeah, you know, right? <laughs> like that's a really great, like a calming color. And I think it does kind of speak to that boho she kind of vibe as well. Yeah. Let's see. Terracotta. Terracotta is a, a good one. Great color. There's the little terracotta pot there. Paloma, thank you. That's a, a really good suggestion. Yeah. I think that middle one kind of kind of terracotta-ish, right? Maybe a little bit more red would make it. Yeah. And for those of you just joining us, hopping in the chat, we'd love to uh, know where you're from, where you're joining us from would be great. Um, I'm joined with Sarah Greer, uh, Gear, sorry, Sarah Gear, and we are, you are currently in uh, California, right? What part of California? Okay. I'm in San the South Bay, uh, San Carlos. San like Carlos. Near the Redwood City, San Mateo area. And Sarah is a uh, product designer, uh, graphic designer, just designer and in, in, in of all cool things. Uh, so be, be sure to follow her on all the social networks, uh, Instagram, Behance, all that good stuff. Uh, Sarah Gear underscore everywhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. I still think like this green can probably be like a little lighter. Reverb Mike with the knowledge, terracotta leaches water if you don't get it glazed. That's a really good, uh, just kind of uh, housekeeping uh, knowledge for your uh, uh, plants that might be dying and you're not sure why. If, they, if, if it's leaching uh, the water, that's not a good thing. Wind up with puddles, oh, it drips out. Yeah, that's right, it just kind of drips out. Yeah, and I know that it also, sometimes you'll get like the calcium buildup. So it's always good to like clean it as well. Um, I guess from like a more of an aesthetic perspective. <clears throat> yeah, so right now we're selecting colors, trying to, uh, you know, come up with the best palette. And, you know, this is something that can also be evolving as your project continues, right? Like, yep. like choosing the colors uh, up front and kind of adjusting them as you go is something that we, we typically do, right? We don't stay fixed all the time in our decisions. Yep, exactly. So I think like I'm good with like maybe these primary colors and like you said, um, it could evolve as we start creating and feel like, you know, maybe a different color might be better. Um, they look great um, so far. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very, uh, very chill vibe. Yeah, I feel like we should play some like chill houseplant music. Well, everyone that's <laughs> everyone that's watching our stream is uh, hearing that music. Okay. <laughs> we we are the only two that don't. But oh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll go with this, and then, like you said, like it could evolve, um, especially once we start building. You want to keep in mind like accessibility. So right. maybe some of these colors might not um, work well from like a contrast perspective. Um, so you'd want to kind of change, you know, gears um, whenever you're, you're building that. Um, but to make that easier, um, since we already do have these like for like our primary colors and everything, we can just start adding these to our library so that if we do need to make any changes at all. Um, yeah, you, using the assets, yeah, totally like great shortcut to save for later. Yeah, so, you know, we have them all here, you know, with their hex code, we can go in and, you know, eventually, just because this is kind of from scratch, not anything that like we have from the beginning, mm -hmm. I'm gonna leave it as is. Um, Usually what I'll do is like, I'd like to organize them with like the primary and the neutrals and like the statuses instead of showing like their hexes here, mm -hmm. uh, just for like a faster and more efficient way for you to be able to pull them. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, 
So that's what we have here for the colors. Um, and then next we can just jump into the typography. So for this, I was thinking something, I really, really like the whole like uh, serif with sans serif uh, pairing. Mm -hmm. um, there's a bunch of ways we could find different pairings. This is something like I just found right off the bat. Um, some uh, places that I do like to look is uh, Type Wolf is like a really great one for, you know, stuff that's usually like a little bit, you don't see all the time. Um, and, you yeah. know, for instance, this was where I actually found those two fonts uh, for Moret and Europa, and they're on Adobe font. So I was able to just, um, just look them up. That's always amazing when you like, there's a font on Type Wolf that's free. I'm just like, you know, like <laughs> it's the worst yeah. like fa falling in love with a font that's like, oh man, it's like $400. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so I did look into it a little bit just to make sure that we wouldn't, you know, fall into that. Um, and since, you know, Moret is on Type Wolf, well, uh, um, Adobe fonts, I was able just to activate them all. Uh, the same thing with uh, Europa. Nice, that's a good one, yeah. Yep. And then you just kind of, you hit the toggle and show up. Yeah. So for this specific one, usually with um, the typography, what I do like to do is kind of thinking of it from like a visual perspective, just kind of um, how would this look like, almost kind of like a style guide. So usually you'll have like, um, the capital letters, what those look like, and then um, the uh, lowercase and oh, that jumped. My keyboard is always glitching nowadays for some reason. So I'll usually just kind of have them all set up like that. Um, just kind of like depending on um, how I want this to look. Yeah, I love this. So like kind of building your style guide um, and then that could later on, if things evolve, like turn it into like a design system. Mm -hmm. nice. Exactly. Yeah, this is a really cool font too. That, yeah, that I really, I kind of liked it. It has like that, um, almost like that magazine uh, mm -hmm. cover type. So yeah, I felt very... like this would look really nice for, you know, our headers um, and all of that. Yeah, it's got a very editorial feel. Mm -hmm. And then for like the different weights, you know, everyone's favorite um, right. little Praise. All right, it's got like what they, they use that because it's got every letter. I think so. And then when you're when you're choosing like your your uh, your fonts, um, mm -hmm. like what's your kind of they use kind of like feel them out and see how they vibe together, kind of put them next to each other. Yeah, um, I typically do kind of uh, like to, oh, hold on, sorry. I like to look at the font pairing sites um, yeah, like just because cool. it helps kind of find uh, what looks good together. Mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, as a freelancer, a lot of the times you're on the fly. Yeah. So. I don't have much time to dive deep into, especially this part when it comes to like the visual design of like the brand identity. Um, I would say earlier on in my career, I would have a lot of time to do that. Right. Um, but nowadays, since I'm more product focused, um, it's really helpful to have those like quick little hacks to find stuff really quickly. Right. And if you are like a freelancer and you have a client, a lot of times like you're kind of you're forced to work with the, the fonts that they use. And so that's just also something to kind of keep in mind once once you're mm -hmm. in, you know, working on a client side is uh, 
design systems are sometimes given to you and you kind of have to make the best out of those pre pre-made decisions, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like, yeah. it's, it's interesting when I can get a, like a client that has this uh, kind of ornate typeface that they're using as like body text and you're, and like your job is to kind of like say, okay, well, this might not be the best use case for this. Cause that's also um, something to consider folks in, in the audience is, you know, this, um, this Moret font is, is a little bit more stylized and, you know, it might not be, or actually it won't be like the best choice for like paragraph case, uh, you know, cause reading like a whole block of text, it, it might be a little difficult. Yeah, definitely. Um, and like, you could already see that here, mm -hmm. um, just all of it together. Obviously I'd have to fix like this, the spacing, um, right. between all the letters and stuff too. But for like headlines and things like that, like they, it could work great, mm -hmm. right? And I think it will, yeah. cause that's like the use case for like a font like this is very decorative and driving that headline experience to make it aesthetically pleasing. Exactly. And that's and, and that's why Europa is a great partner to it, right? Because that's the legibility piece. It's like, it's great. It's that's why I, I also agree with you. Like I love mixing uh, serif with sans serif. Like I, I'm with you on that. It's it's like the perfect merger of like form and function, and and being able to have like a practical use font like Europa, and then like a very ornate kind of decorative font like Moret. So folks watching and. You know, that's just for me, like a vibe that I like to roll with too. Yep. And then like some stuff to always like keep in mind. So like, for instance, with uh, Europa, it only has like three weights, bold, light and regular. Um, when picking, you want to be cognizant of that mm -hmm. just because you want to see if you're going to have like enough flexibility um, between uh, the different options. Uh, for what you're using it for. So to me, like these three, that's good enough um, because it's probably going to be used more for like just the regular text, like the body copy and um, maybe like the subheading. Uh, so using like visual hierarchy with the different weights is always helpful as well as with like the size um, of the font too. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's, that's a very, very good practice is to make sure that all your headlines are accounted for. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and that's what we'll go into next. Nice. So I'm quickly just kind of going in uh, through with all of these. Obviously, nothing is like stylized and, right. you know, what the final form. Right. Um, this is just to kind of set the our groundings for um, what we'll be using to build um, for the app. Yeah, great. And if you are just joining us, we are here with Sarah Gear product designer and lover of animals and plants. And we are designing some really, a really cool app that is gonna help us uh, take care of our plants and, and maybe help them take care of themselves. And that's uh, hinting at some of these uh, potential features. So if you have any, uh, any, any ideas around typefaces that you love, uh, any questions for Sarah, uh, please shoot them into the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Awesome. So here's kind of where we're going to go into the type skill, what we were talking about with like our headers, um, subtitles. I apologize in advance for my typing. <laughs> my keyboard for some reason likes to double type. Um, it's Letters. been like a, yeah. 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 So um, anyway, we'll be going into the type scale for like our headers, the subtitle, body, you know, any small or like caption uh, type of uh, copy. Um, another good one would probably be like quotes, if there's any. Uh, and then this is where we'll start building uh, those different type skills to add as a character style. Uh, so that we could easily use that in as we're building the mobile application. Yeah, I, I like I, I typically work the same way, especially, you know, once you've kind of like thought through a project, you can quickly it's more of a workflow uh, shortcut, you know, being able to have all these things predetermined beforehand. That way you're not just kind of using all kinds of fonts everywhere and like different sizes for different 
re, you know, re, reusing the same size font and with a bold or a, you know, a normal weight. So yeah, this is a very good tip for, for new designers to like think about the typefaces you're going to be using for your interface uh, before you even start designing the interface. You know, if, if you're in jumping into wireframes or you've already, you know, sketched out your ideas, um, def definition is going to be a, a very good workflow shortcut. Yeah, definitely. Um, I remember when I like first got into design, I never created like my symbols or like components or anything at all. And I would go ham and like create yeah. like 50 screens yeah. sometimes. And then I'd have to change one thing. And because I did yeah. not start thinking ahead of time yeah. from like a system level, I would have to go to each specific screen <laughs> and change it. And it was a nightmare. <laughs> it's almost so sometimes- Don't be me. <laughs> no, it's, it's almost sometimes easier to like, if you get to that point, just like scrap all those old screens and like just create new screens with like the, the updated components and, and fonts. Cause I've been there too. And it's like updating, you have to select everything and then you might miss one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But Voodoo Val's digging the vibe. I'm digging the vibe. It's very warm, very tranquil. I think these typefaces are going to be uh, going to work really great in an interface. Um, and today we're doing a mobile interface. And uh, iOS, is that kind of the, the vibe we're going to? Is, is yeah. Kind of sticking in and just yeah. kind of using your broader imagination that we are inclusive and we would admit, imagine a concept like this also living on the, uh, uh, the Android platform because Android people have plants too, right? Yeah, of course, yes. <laughs> Everybody's got plants. Like NASA recommends that you have at least like 18 plants for every 1200 square feet. So like, yeah. I, I would- Yeah, I would, especially with fire season. Yeah, so. filter, natural filters, right? Yeah. Like I read I read that like the, the most accessible plant to help your air is like a snake plant and they, cause they suck in a lot of carbon. Um, so these, these, are, these are really, really, uh, plants can just elevate your air quality even if you think they're really hard to take care of a lot of times it just takes a little bit of a schedule and that's that's what that's what sarah's helping us with right now is understanding these pieces of, of the puzzle to help our plants thrive i'm with you i have i have tons of plants in my house um i don't have any animals so i don't really have to worry about the plants i have like that's something for me that i i've learned is sometimes there's plants that you're not supposed to have for certain animals there's yeah. To toxic plants. So keeping yeah. that in mind as well. Exactly. And that's like something that, you know, we could include into the app as we design it as a feature of like letting owners know what plants are toxic or not to their pets. Um, because that is a very, very real thing. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like I, I had no idea. And it's like, you know, if you have a toxic plant near your like little dachshund, like that's, that's gonna, that's gonna be <laughs> problematic. Yeah. You know? Definitely. Dungy's the plant eater in our house. Like he oh. just will go after all the plants and then he'll end up getting an upset stomach and throwing up. So that's oh, always man. fun. <laughs> I feel um, so I just started kind of just playing around with ideas on like what things can look like here for like the H1 and H2 from a typeface perspective. Um, been playing with like the body copy being a font size of like 18. Um, sometimes what I like to do, especially, so for instance, like you mentioned, I'm going to be building for iOS. I like to look at the guidelines, um, for Apple or even material design. One of the items that I, you know, something that I took from actually when I was, uh, at boot camp was this site. Um, it's like a cheat sheet. Uh, this one's a little older. It's from, it was last updated in December of 2019, but just like it gives you an idea of what like the different resolution and display specs are uh, for the different iPhones. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's like another thing to keep in mind for like your breakpoints, especially once you start moving into like Android, since there's so many of them, um, you'll, you'd want to design for a couple of them just to make sure that you're hitting the majority. Um, so that as it scales, it'll do so properly. Right. Um, and then again, you know, an added thing to that is, you know, setting up a proper grid um, in advance to ensure that it'll scale well. That's awesome. And so, uh, yeah, Nor said that their dog ate an aloe vera plant and it was really fit oh afterwards. So it beneficial, it health benefits of, of aloe. <laughs> awesome. So, you know, like for instance here, 
sometimes I like to remember. So obviously with iOS, they're going off of, you know, their system font. Um, but I like to look at the size because this could help me with understanding of what might be too big, what might be too small. Um, so for instance, the smallest size that you're going to see is probably like a 10 point font. And that was like for like the tab bar, um, buttons, so like little labels for the navigation. Right. Um, just to get an idea, since we're obviously not using their system font, we're using different fonts. This at least gives me like a baseline of like right. knowing of like where I could go um, with the type scale for that. So, very, very so far good. I have this, like the title at 40, which I think it might work um, for, for this one since it is a little bit of like a tighter font. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll just keep the title at that uh, for now. And then again, if we need to change it, we can always change it. It's not set in stone. Yeah, totally. No, that's a really good practice too. Anyone watching um, really, really um, would recommend using like some sort of system that at least verifies your sizings. And so people are asking for the URL on this. Um, is there, maybe we can uh, read it to them and we can. I can uh, yeah, it's. Here, I, what I'll do is do this so that you guys can have it while I am designing. And I will make this. Nice, right, thank you for that. All these resources are always very, very appreciated. And then obviously this is just a cheat sheet. Always keep in mind, like for instance, that was from December of last year from when like uh, iPhone 11. So it's not gonna have everything from like the right. newest iOS 14 drop. Um, so this is just like I said, a baseline. You are gonna wanna go to the holy grail of it to like the actual Apple design if for like the most up to date. Yeah, um, and that's the uh, information. The, the the, uh, you know, the Apple human, human interface guidelines. Uh, mm -hmm. so you can just, you know, Google human interface guidelines, Apple, uh, you'll be able to definitely, uh, find something maybe more like that has updated, you know, new screen sizes and they're always going to update too. So, uh, and the great thing too, is like Adobe XD will do a great job at giving you a lot of these templates. Um, and when you create an artboard, it kind of already has some of those, uh, features built in to give you those spec sizes. And, um, you know, a lot of times it'll give you the newest spec sizes that come out for the new phones. So just always keep that in mind too, that, uh, that Adobe XD does do a great job at providing you with some of those starting points. So I'm just setting the size and seeing like how I like it. Um, I typically like to go with like um, eight point grids. So even with like my uh, font sizes, I'll go um, with uh, multiples of eight. If I need to go even smaller, I'll break it down to like four um, for some cases, but I try to stick with like eight point. So it'll be anything. So for instance, this 40, um, I have this one at 32. Unsure if I'm gonna make this 24, but just so you get the gist of it, like that's where like the numbers are coming up um, for me and how I'm going about it. Cool. And you're getting uh, some kudos for the, the competitive analysis and some of the things you did up front in the mood boards. So yeah, if you're just joining us, we've, we've kind of, like Sarah's done a lot of things already. If the, you know, like mood boarding, competitive analysis on the research side, um, and then understanding a lot of these, uh, like just a visual design, uh, consistency metrics, like color and, uh, font sizes and headline sizes and, and font type. So, uh, this is a really great way to, to kind of pre-work, um, and, you know, utilize workflow as a way for you to, uh, kind of not have to repeat work and just kind of do this stuff up front, which is really, really great idea. Yeah. So if anybody has questions for. Sarah, please go ahead and add them into the chat. All right, so I went ahead and I already added them as character styles. And as you could see, like I have all of them selected. So 
as I click through these character styles on the side, it's changing all of them, which is great. Um, let me undo though, because they <laughs> don't all need to be the same. <laughs> no, but that's just a good demo on how quick how quick you can change every uh, font type, right? Yeah, exactly. And you're, you basically, you systematized them already. So mm -hmm. take advantage people of the asset panel. It's really, really helpful. Like for your colors and your fonts and your components and all that. It's a really, really helpful tool. Yeah, definitely. Um, so something that I'm just going to set just to kind of show from a framework perspective, because I'm not going to build it out completely yet. Um, and again, I just do this from a perspective of well, we don't know 100% what we're building. So as we start actually using these different um, character styles, we might realize, you know, the kerning needs to, you know, change right. or the, the, the spacing between the paragraph spacing needs to, to be updated. Um, so I could do that quickly within the styles. And then once I have a few screens that are showing a lot of repetitive um, elements, that's when I start like diving even deeper into you know what that character style is and I want to further define it um but just from just so like you guys so everyone knows um some items that I would like I usually would like to show is like I'll show what typeface it is because obviously there's different ones here so identifying what typeface is being used what weight the size, and then this then also helps when it comes down to like handoff. Um, so the developers would know um, exactly uh, what the uh, CSS like elements need to be for the different fonts. Right. That's that double, that double typing your keyboard does. I see it in real time. No, I know. <laughs> like I literally don't know why it does that. <laughs> I'm using like a mechanical keyboard and it was like even before I used the mechanical keyboard. Yeah, it's um, just like, you just have like a, a like a, the opposite of autocorrect. <laughs> yeah, it's like, let's multiply yeah. this sentence by a 10. <laughs> um, so this is just like an idea. So like the typeface that's being used, the weight, the size, um, line spacing, tracking use cases. So for instance, you know, you'd be using this for titles, or if you even want to get more specific, like blog posts, titles, or something like that, you could add all of that information here. Right. So it's all found in one home. And then even the case, because, you know, we might find that one of we might want to have a um, type that we're using like title or, or I'm sorry, like all uppercase or all lowercase, for instance. Yeah. And then sometimes I'll even go further to adding like color. And then this is where, again, like the accessibility point comes in, um, because you could define that, you know, this specific type can only be used in these certain colors. Um, you know, even from like a branding perspective as well. Right. I can, and I can tell that you've had experience with uh, like spreadsheets. <laughs> am, I, am, am I assuming correctly? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. I like it. No, it's, it's definitely like showing how you organize your work. And that's something that I think is really, really a good thing to do as a designer is to be structurally organized with your information. And the best way to do that is data sheets. Like, <laughs> Like, because everything that lives on the back end is technically on a data sheet. So you're helping, you're helping speak the language of an engineer or developer by doing this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, and I'm married to one too. So it's like, <laughs> like, I really understand the language sometimes um, yeah. as well. <laughs> so. No, that's, that's, I, I could see it. <laughs> this is like, <laughs> yeah, that, that's totally effective way of communication. Just give me a spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I would say like those were like the main items, um, from like, at least the styles perspective. Um, I'm not going to go into this cause we haven't picked out any icons or, or anything like that, but I would include like iconography. Um, another one would be like imagery. 
that's going to be used. Um, what else? And then like, if we have a logo, which, you know, like maybe I'll put this up to everyone. We'll go with like, you know, a simple um, word mark. Um, but how about everyone names the app that we're building? Yeah. We'll get some, we'll get some options for some, uh, some names for this, uh, this plant app. We can't use planta, right? Cause that one's obviously yes. taken. There's some, there's some out there that are taken. Even if they are, it's okay. We can, we can, uh, we can riff on some things. Yeah. Um, so from there, what we can do is like start building some components that, you know, we know are going to be used. So for instance, buttons, like that's going to be in the app, like regardless. So we could start building out, you know, what the different buttons are and, um, the states for that. We'll do though. What I didn't do is name these properly. So I'm actually going to take the time and name this so that I can go ahead and. You have, I think you have a name. That's really good. Uh, Plantasia. <laughs> okay. We'll keep more coming. I like that one. Yeah. yeah. That's good. So far, it's the only one, so it's a front runner. <laughs> uh, oh, chlorophyling. That's good. <laughs> I like that. All right. Any more, any more uh, names? Will the app have some sort of plant recognition feature? Uh, the user just takes a pic of the plant and identifies it automatically. Yeah, why not? <laughs> I don't see why not. I mean, like uh, Planta does that. Um, and obviously that would require a lot like machine learning and all that stuff. But, um, but yeah, that's definitely a feature that we can um, Add right. to right. So the the nor nor asked that question, and the so there is there are apps out there that do that, which is really cool. Uh, you know, building a like a light machine learning kind of algorithm is obviously some back end trickery, but like to be able to do that with an app, you know, we just use a camera, um, and that's possibly a feature that this app can have. But there are there are apps that have that feature, so we might I think Sarah might be exploring some. Uh, some of the uh, the opportunities that aren't around, right? Yeah, exactly. But that is a really cool one. <laughs> like, and I think I think most people, like, there's a lot of, I wouldn't say there's a lot of apps like that, but I feel like that is one of the more popular ways to, to discover is like, you know, identification. Um, they have that with like plants, they have it with insects. Uh, and those are really, really cool um, educational tools, especially like if you have children or, or, you know, people that are just like interested in, um, finding out how to take care of the plant they have. Cause I think that is like a use case for that is you buy a plant from maybe Craigslist or somebody and you're not really sure what the breed is. They think it's something else. And then, you know, the care instructions might not translate because you assume that you're caring for a certain plant but it's actually a different plant. Like <laughs> that kind of sucks. So being able to identify it is is really cool. And so, yeah, that I would I would say that is a cool feature for sure. Using them. Oh, here it is. Yeah, that. Oh, chlor chlorophyling. That's another name, chlorophyling. So that we keep that. We'll keep that in the hat. We got plantasia and chlorophyling. some components being built. And uh, for as a reminder, anybody that is interested in, uh, you know, having their, uh, their, their themselves spotlighted in our artist spotlight, uh, just make yourself known that you uh, would like to be included. Um, uh, we, we would also recommend you recommend other people. So if you if there are people that you think are standing out in uh, the Behance community, 
uh, give them a shout out because uh, we are going to be uh, looking at somebody's uh, somebody's profile coming up. And it's just a really good way to kind of spotlight people who are just doing great work out there and inspiring others because that's what we do, right? Like as designers, one of the main things that uh, we, we like to do is look for inspiration out there. So um, be that voice for others to, to inspire them. And I think that's what Sarah is doing here is uh, giving inspiration on, on how to organize yourself to help your efficiency while you're in the design process. And, and for, for me and my perspective, I think both of us are kind of in the same way we work. I work for a, an agency that takes on all kinds of different projects. And when you have agency uh, clients, like a lot of times you're just given a design system, hopefully, but sometimes it's just a, a style guide, a, just a direction uh, that they need to stay in. Uh, because they have their own, uh, you know, stakeholders and whatnot. So um, what basically we're simulating what it would be like for someone just be handed a design system and just like, hey, here's the things you need to work with, make something. And that's a really, really, like, I think constraints is the word that comes to mind is being given a constraint like this helps guide you. So later on, you can kind of just make, put the pieces together and kind of just make a puzzle. And sometimes you'll need to create new components and you'll have new directions you need to go in. And that's part of the process too, is, is speaking to stakeholders about what it is that you recommend. Cause that, that's what we do as UX designers is a lot of times we set the vision and recommend ways that the product can be used. Yeah. So another bloom is another really great name. Thank you for that recommendation. Uh, Seedler. Yeah. Seedler. I like that. It got, it got some like, I got Seedler with the, the, the made up kind of fake word, very, very tech inspired. <laughs> it's S-E-E-D-L-R. I like it. Well, there goes the double typing. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I, oh. I had a moment where I was like, why isn't this creating a, hey. a type <laughs> you, you style? And then I realized it was the same. I was trying to duplicate something. <laughs> You're good. That's why, you know, I, I, I feel, I feel the void with, uh, with, with certain things I could talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so we got oh. buttons coming soon. I love this. This is like a, a tour down the design system path. It's, yes. This is amazing. <laughs> I've, I've worked like this uh, a few times and this is like, like a very, a very unique way of working is like, uh, you know, like I said, sometimes when you're a contractor, you're given a system. And so Sarah's building the system and then we're going to let the system kind of uh, create our experience, right? And like create the buttons in it up front and you can modify them as you go and it'll just update everywhere and you're going to see it. It's going to be magic. Yeah. Um, all right, so we will jump into buttons. So the cool thing that I actually really like about XD is for like the different states within the button, how you can kind of have them all under one, mm -hmm. um, which is really, really fun. <laughs> um, little tr uh, trick about it. Uh, so we'll go ahead and just make like our default uh, button text. Um, just call this, we'll call it our primary button. Yeah, I, I love states. Com component states, states is like, I, I think for me, like my favorite feature, like a lot of people was, is auto animate and it's still probably one of my favorite features, but um, repeat grid, like classic features, but then the states is, is game changing because you're, you're, you're able to you know, like you said, like build in multiple states on one thing without having to create multiple versions, multiple artboards, reduce the clutter. Just a really, really cool way to like have it interactive and show people. And then, you know, developers can then see what you're doing, which is also cool because you need that. Like if you're ever designing a button, you're not just ever designing one button. You're designing like at least four buttons, right? Yeah. So I am just kind of figuring out like sizing, like what, how I want it to look um, from like a padding perspective. Um, 
think I'm gonna make these a little bit rounded on the corners. Yeah, my this is always my like. I, I I tried not to stick with the same type of buttons, but I, you know, like, <laughs> it's like either I I have I, I don't think I've ever used a button that's completely like not rounded. Like there's always at least like a two to four pixel, or if not, completely yeah, round, you know? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I mean, a lot of it too is just kind of softens the look, yeah, mm -hmm. as well. Versus like the you know like with the zero radius, it just feels like really sharp. <laughs> Yeah, and and you know we're working with plants here, so you know we don't want to be too, too sharp, right? We want to be kind of mm. gentle. So we got some other recommendations. Car Car Carolina said this: uh, plant plus seedling equals plantling. I love that. Flora, another really great one. There's so many. We got we got so much support here. You guys are amazing. I love that. So. Here's like where I'm starting to check like contrast and everything. I really like the plugin Stark um, for that. But so like what I'm doing here is trying to figure out like, you know, what is the button color going to be? Started with the green. I think it's okay. Still unsure. Yeah. Um, figure it's a, we could. It's a good contrast button, right? Yeah, it definitely is like that will probably most likely like pass like right. any sort of, yeah, flying yeah. colors. Flying <laughs> colors, no pun intended there. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is just kind of where it just starts where, you know, maybe we might start evolving some of those colors that we had like originally chosen. Um, so I kind of like the, the way the pink looks, um, but we'll see, I'm not sure yet. just kind of playing around with like the colors we had originally picked out. And then here, when I did uh, like test the, the, the contrast for it, you know, it doesn't pass. Yeah. And for those of you that are wondering what Stark is, if you don't know the background, uh, it is a really, really great tool that allows you to do many things accessibility related, primarily it is, it is an accessibility tool, but checking contrast and that is the lowest hanging fruit of problems on the on the web are mm -hmm. contrast issues contrast and color usage are the biggest offenders of accessibility uh you know problems so just using something like this is a really great tool yeah and and like it's like like you said um it is like the lowest hanging fruit that i feel like can be easily fixed mm -hmm. if like you're being cognizant of it from like the beginning mm -hmm. um and that's why I think like even from like a design system perspective, it's more than just like, oh, we're creating this like whole system. But like if you're starting from scratch, it's like you, it's a mindset of like a systems approach of like, OK, what is my decision right now? Like what are the consequences that it could, um, you know, cause uh, down the line? Uh, so thinking of things like that. One thing that I really like about the Stark plugin is that like they now added like suggestions that you could use yep. um, and like, you know what the pairing might look like. So for instance, if we try this, oh, okay, this is what that's going to look like if we did this like darker one. Um, so it'll give you options, which is really, really cool. Yeah, and totally. And on the topic of plugins, if anybody in the chat like has a favorite plugin that they love, uh, share it. We, we love plugins here. Uh, they, anything, like I said, to, to optimize a workflow, like this is a accessibility workflow tool. So it, and it, it saves you a lot of time to have to go out of the system and come back in. So yeah, yeah. Share, share your plugins. We would love to know, like, aside from Stark, like what's your other, like most used plugin? Oh, I have to go look at them. Um, I love rename it. It's a very, very easy, yeah. practical tool. Yeah, definitely. Um, so like some other ones are like Anima sometimes um, that was like really helpful before like the whole like Stacks. auto. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and like and the stacking was already like built in was yep. one that I used to use a lot. Yep. Um, the whiteboard's cool for collaboration, right? Mm hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And then like this person doesn't exist. Like if you're looking just for like 
photos of people for like avatars or something like it'll like generate oh, yeah. um that's that still blows my mind right yeah <laughs> <laughs> still i'll never get over that like these people aren't real for real <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I would say like the Stark one is like the biggest one that I use like all the time. It's like, I just always, that's the first thing that I use. Yeah, and we have a question for you uh, from Carolina. Uh, how do you approach the process of deciding which font weight size to use uh, for each type of component? That's a good question. Yeah, so when I was building it up here, um, I was like kind of already thinking about that in the back of my head. So for instance, that's why I had this style for a button. Um, it's basically the same as like a body copy is 18, but I just made it bold mm -hmm. um, from like a readability standpoint. Um, but it's something that like I could easily change like once I start building. Um, I'm thinking of also the fact that I'm using a phone. So I want to make sure that it's big enough so somebody can actually see it. So I'm not going to use like a really small, like 14 font, for instance. Right. Um, so I'll usually opt for something that's usually like simple because like with a button too, like you're adding color to it. So it's already going to stand out. Yeah. Um, totally. Legibility, right? Is like the, the biggest thing, as long as it's legible, and uh, you, it conveys it conveys the, the the call to action that you need. You know, hierarchy, paying attention to that stuff is really important for components and buttons and stuff. Yeah, definitely. So, and as a reminder for all watching, in about seventeen minutes, we are going to have the artist spotlight. So. Please uh, stay tuned to see who, and maybe it's you. Maybe you're the artist that we're spotlighting today. That would be, that would be, and if you are in the audience, I, I can't wait to see if you are. <laughs> that would be really cool because we got a really cool portfolio uh, or pro Behance profile to show you. It's going to be really great. I'm really excited for that. Awesome. So like one thing before, like I turned this into a component was like you had already seen, like I was already kind of thinking of like padding from like within with the top bottom being 16, 40 on both sides. So again, using like multiples of eight here, but like the cool thing here is that I could add it to this whole group. Um, so it's showing it here, like the top um, and bottom with the right and left uh, for that. And yeah, that padding feature is really, really cool. Yeah. Just keeping consistent, all the consistency that you can get, right? Exactly. So another thing that I'm going to do is in response to the size, like how responsive it's going to be. So the reason I want to do that is we also don't want it to turn into, you know, like a button that like, it just like, as you type, it just keeps like getting longer like that, because then it's like, Okay, what's the point? Yeah, right. You're gonna want like a like a, a maximum width. Oop. Sorry, the Midwestern me came out. I'm like, whoop. <laughs> anybody who knows <laughs> knows. <laughs> um, so what I usually like to do is like it's gonna have a. Now I'm like catching myself and I'm constantly doing that. No, uh, <laughs> I noticed that in Chicago when I live there, like people apologize a lot. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I'm like, Why are you apologizing? <laughs> and so Joe, you got some good tools there. Yeah. Repeat, uh, repeater for repeat grids, great icon for design for your uh, consistency with icons. Uh, and then I think for me, Google Sheets plugin is really cool. Um, automating uh, any content is always, I'm always a huge fan of. Um, that's that's definitely a really, really cool plugin. I totally, everybody who is interested in exploring Google Sheets, it's awesome. Okay, so here's like <clears throat> something I like to do personally. So I'll, I'm, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'm going to be turning this into a component, but I usually like to start um, 
cleaning my file. Um, I think like that's something that I guess it's like weird for a designer to instead of having like a rectangle 36 here, like I would call this like the like a button background or something like that. Um, I'm very like picky yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah, this is that's I mean I think this is you, you touched on something for me that is very near and dear is just like being thorough with layer naming. And it's something that a lot of times, you know, when we're working really fast, we kind of overlook. But it, if you're handing anything off to anybody, it, whether it's another designer you're collaborating with or a developer in the, uh, the end game, you will be a saint in their eyes if everything is at least named. It might not be the final naming convention when it's published, but at least everything is named. And it's exactly. Just, you're doing you're doing most of the work up front. Exactly. And especially as a freelancer, it's like something to keep in mind. Like you're not on a project forever. Mm -hmm. So it's almost the way I see it is like a courtesy. So it's oh, like, yeah. how is it the next person who gets my file? Mm -hmm. You know, how are they going to be able to sift through it? Because I've gotten files where it's basically oh, just it's better cool. to start from scratch because yeah. it's just, I can't even get through all of the layers. And there's nested, um, nested layers and nested, yeah. And it's just everything, nothing's named. You don't know what is what, totally. It's exactly. a nightmare. It is, it really, really is. So for me as a freelancer, that's something that like, you know, I add and I let, you know, my clients know that that's like an added thing that I like to include. Like that's like oh, the bow tie on top. It's not only a, here's the handoff so that the designs come to life the way you're seeing them um, from a developer standpoint, but it's also anybody who gets their hands on my file, they're gonna understand like what my thought process was, was because like I was so intricate in how I, you know, named my layers and organized everything. Um, so it's always something to keep in mind. And it also helps you um, so that like, if you have to go back, you can quickly go back yeah. uh, versus trying to like go through the jumble of like your digital paper of files that you're trying to like understand what you did. Totally. And and uh, Warisha, Warisha has a, a, a question like rename it. What is it used for? And it's kind of like for this, like if you, if you use the rename it plugin, uh, it is kind of like a way to quickly like mo select multiple components, multiple, layers and just bulk rename uh you could you could just do individual uh components and rename them but yeah it's a it's a really helpful tool for that but sarah is doing the work for us up front and so we don't have to use that tool later <laughs> yeah was, exactly yeah yeah that's great uh but yeah it's even a good like joe it does really good call out it's even good for yourself like if you pick up this project in months that way you kind of you're hopping in and you know what's going on it's it's just it's just a good practice. Yeah, definitely. Oh, what did I do? Okay. So I already created this into a component. Um, so this is what I have as the default state. So like the different states that I like to like think of um, usually are, I'm just going to call them out. So you have your default state. Uh, I always do like, well, a hover isn't going to be necessary for mobile. Right. Mobile. Sorry. Um, Error state, right? Default. Yeah. Um, there's like an inactive. Inactive. Yeah, inactive. And it might not be. It might not be. Yeah, it depends on like how yeah. we end up. Um, and then there's like a pressed state. Right. So I would say like, these are the three that I can think of at the top of my head yeah. that would want to do. So like, I'm already thinking like maybe the default should be a lighter green so that like when it's pressed, it's, it looks, it's darker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is where, why it's like, you know, the colors is just like living, you know, you're always going to be playing, especially as you start like creating these components. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'll probably, we're going to play the color game again, <laughs> um, to, I'm going to start playing with the opacity to see if that helps. Let's go to 80 and then keeping in mind that it looks like a weird green. Uh, you know what? So 
I'm actually going to change this to a white background for now. Oh yeah, because better context. I want. To... I'm sorry. Better context for the color, right? Yes, exactly. Because that other oh, <laughs> opacity yeah. turned it into look like a booger green. Um, <laughs> And that's something to keep in mind, right? When you're designing for interfaces, like the color around what you're designing will impact what the perception of that color is. It's, exactly. it's tra color translation theory is is uh, is a real thing. If you you know you you might have a color that looks a certain way, but next to a you know seventy five percent gray, it might look different next to a white. So those are also for I, I'm not not the best skilled in which colors to choose. But definitely, like a little bit of knowledge in color translation theory is good. Mm -hmm. And then, just like you're saying, like a lot of this is just kind of like messing around and fudging things, you know, just to see, like, should I add like more white to it? Or, and then this is where I knew that I did not like that original green because I felt like it needed work. Yeah, it's a little like you find so, it out. Later. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to try one more time on a green. Ah, you're and... good. We got, we got eight more minutes until the artist spotlight and then we'll do that and you know come back to your work and continue on. So folks, if, if you are interested in uh, having your work featured, uh, please let us know that you want your work featured and we'll uh, do our best to uh, include you and if you have anybody else in mind that is just doing great work out there on Behance and inspiring you, uh, drop their name in and we could uh, also add them to the Artist Spotlight. And it's right there at the top of your, uh, your chat box. So if you are logging on YouTube, yeah, come over here to Behance and you have that feature for you. And Warisha. I, I, I feel like that wasn't too hard of a, uh, I hope people aren't butchering your name too much. It seems pretty phonetically uh, legible, at least. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't butcher it. <laughs> Got the text. Okay, I'm gonna leave it at this and I'll have to like fudge with it a little bit more. Yeah, you can always adjust the colors in a little bit. Exactly. And what I will do next is our secondary. Right, and folks that are maybe not sure about like why you would need primary and secondary, uh, you know, it's just a good practice to have your, uh, your hierarchy of attention being called uh, the, the primary uh, call to action or button, whatever that might be, is usually like going to be a little bigger, a little bit more pronounced, maybe a little darker. Um, I'm just, and I'm sure, Sarah, do you have any uh, insight on, on that, what your thought process is around primary and secondaries? Yeah, I think like it usually will help with like differentiating, um, especially from a hierarchy perspective, like what's more important. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're gonna have two buttons on a screen, you typically, you want them to select one specific, you know, a specific right. one. So it's like, you want them to say yes, not no, for instance. So you'd wanna use like the primary for like the yes button and the secondary um, for the no. Um, just so like different cases like that sometimes even just from like an aesthetic look like you know a certain page so like for instance i could see i don't know like maybe from like a catalog perspective it might look nicer if it's like a secondary look instead um so for here i what i'm gonna do is actually going to swap <clears throat> Uh, do the outline mode kind of thing? Yeah. Why isn't this? Listen to a... Uh... Okay. 
So it could look something like this. Um, it's usually the typical one that you'd see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, outline version of it, right? Yeah. Totally. And then another way that I usually always like to, to do is um, like a link one, like a text link. Right. Um, and then here is where, there's the library. You know, like I already started thinking about how that could look. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like an underline or, you know, I'm not a fan of the underline one. So like maybe- right, it's a little too close. I've always felt that like you should be able yeah. to separate that a little bit. Like sometimes usually what I have done too is like, I'll like use a line or like a rectangle instead and then use like the tools like for um, like the padding between it. Mm -hmm. um, to create like its own um, underline instead of yeah. like the actual underline, because like you said, it gets too close. It could look really weird with um, certain letters. Uh, so it gives you a little bit more flexibility there. Uh, another thing we could do is make it all caps if we want. So I don't think we're going to do that. Maybe we'll leave a title case for now. But like these are like your basic three buttons that you're going to want to like start thinking of um, along with like their different states. Um, I'll probably come back to that just because I want to play with the colors a little bit more mm -hmm. um, to get the states in a, a place that um, we could work with. We got two more minutes until we're going to do the artist spotlight. So we'll take a pause from the work, but keep continue working, do your thing. And then uh, folks, if you are interested in, uh, uh, in sticking around for it, it's going to be really cool to, to kind of see what what we are looking at in terms of uh, uh, like Behance profiles that are just like really standouts. Nice. I could I could spend days on foreign field. Foreign field. <laughs> I, I feel like like it's such a it's such a like very very like widely used thing and a lot of times it's wrong it's get people get it wrong but and i noticed you earlier you, you i saw a plugin you had like a um, the adobe uh, spectrum which is a really mm -hmm. good tool to kind of get see what other people are doing out there and form fields, yeah they do form fields great you know yeah and then like even from like from design systems this is like a site that i really like it's like the design systems repo um that it lets you see like all of these companies and like the different um, design right. systems that might be like open source uh, for you to look at. Yeah, that's great. And, and, and for new designers, like that is the key is just kind of seeing what's out there and seeing how to, how to, you know, make sure to not fall in some traps that other people are falling into, but also just see and be inspired by like what is practical and what are people really using? which is just a really, really cool thing. That's a great resource too. Um, and so yeah. we, got, we got 20 seconds until we're gonna jump into the, uh, the artist spotlight today, uh, which is what we do every Monday. It's a really, really great way to highlight artists and uh, designers that are out there just doing great work. Uh, so we're gonna come back to Sarah's work in a sec, but let's go ahead and hop on over to uh, my screen so we could see uh, who we got on the, on the roster today to look at. So, so yeah, we got uh, Kalpesh Prithyani and a uh, student from MIT, industrial designer uh, from uh, Pune, India. So we, we just, let's jump into some projects here. I mean, just off the bat, uh, looking at a, a, a Netflix case study and, you know, we all spend tons of time on Netflix and I, I would just off the bat, like I'm already liking the presentation uh, and 
and how you know you can use like these images to just kind of convey storytelling and and just giving a, a, a an overview of your project is always a really great practice uh, background and like doing some little showing research uh, you know industrial design and interaction design and product design are all very similar and you know being able to you know understand research is really really great uh, kind of similarity that bridges everything together really amazing uh, looking uh, you know illustrations you're using and whether you source them or make them yourself like I'm not sure but they look great yeah I really like the presentation of um, how he's telling the story of yeah. how he went through this project right. um, it's very well like distributed need the need assessment is really really great like you know some of these uh, uh, secondary research to you know point to some of the facts that you're using to utilize your like why you're making these decisions, you know, cause that's a big part of it is like, why are we making the decisions we're making? And if we can show that through metrics and research is, is the best way to do so. And, and so for newcomer designs, like Nana um, asked in the, in the chat, like, you know, how do you get into design? I would say looking, looking into what people are doing out there, seeing what you want to do with your career. Uh, this is a very research heavy um, first glimpse at this project, which is amazing. Um, but then, you know, there's, there's strategy and budget. Like this person like took this project to another level. Um, and, and this is what we really, uh, you know, admire in, in portfolios and, um, you know, whatever you create on, on Behance, it's just like the thoroughness of it. And there's a little video here. Look at that. It's got audio. Yeah. I'll just keep that. That way Black Panther, rest in peace, Chadwick Boseman. Uh, really really cool here like kind of just tying everything together and how you're uh, interacting with like the social aspect of netflix i think that's like a big thing that's been missing you know from netflix is is kind of social component right this is really cool great stuff here let's jump into another project All right. Can you see this one, Sarah? Yep. We got Berg. Berg looks like a, what would you say just off the bat? It's definitely a dashboard, obviously. Right. I'm like, I'm and trying to guess. I'm trying to guess. Like, what is it at first? I know. I saw the little plant and I was like, is this a plant? I, I like trying. I like trying to guess at what things are before the description. Then you get it into looks like construction. Ah, new tent. or like urban planning, maybe. So Berg was my sub submission to the challenge. So uh, this is also just like why the creative challenge is so great because people do this as a way to understand how to design and, and how to get roles in, in companies is they do challenges, and so um, it looks like this is a way to promote responsible living among cities by monitoring them across multiple parameters. So very, very uh, good description. Uh, we got like the process detailed out for us. We got some animations going. This is really snazzy. And see, this is a great thing about Behance because you can like pull in all of these like little micro interactions in your, in your experience. And then like having the depth to go into your, your research on every project is, is gonna really, really give you just so many viewers and so much inspire so many people uh, loving the ideation process, showing us the storyboarding. I love it. This is awesome. So being able to take the time to storyboard is also just like really going to help you explain to yourself, if not others, how your project or product is going to live in the outside world and how to, how to test your ideas with stakeholders and users, um, defining your, your future user testings. And then, you know, building the prototype, obviously, like starting from a flow diagram to translating flow, flow diagrams into an interface and wireframes, it's all connected and it's all part of like a thorough process. Uh, and so um, Sarah's been, you know, giving us a, a short, shortened version of her process. Um, so what would you, would you speak to like how this process would impact like what you do and, and, and how you show your work? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, like even from what we're doing today with like the visual design aspect and um, what I was talking about, like when picking for like a mood board 
about like what the feeling invokes, usually like getting um, some research ahead of time to, you know, speaking to plant parents, seeing what is it that's actually missing to find those opportunities is super key when starting any sort of, of product um, at all, because like it's gonna help you create like really good design decisions down the road because you know that what you're creating is actually gonna be something that the user needs and wants. Exactly. And I love these micro interactions with like logo types, mm -hmm. like turning a logo type into a mark in an animation, really smart way to kind of communicate, uh, you know, then giving us the icons and libraries used, uh, the the fonts, the icon, um, you know, tools, the material usage is just, just a really great way to kind of look as an example of uh, like, what is what is a good uh place look like for you to kind of be inspired by because uh, Kalpesh is doing some really, really great work here. Uh, is there one of these that you'd want to see, Sarah, off the top? Um, let's look at that stride one. Stride, let's see that, it looks cool. Let's see what this is. Trekking and hiking, nice. stride. So always putting your description up front, right? Really, really mm -hmm. just a great way to kind of communicate up front. Yeah, and, I, and the little tags to tell you of like what to expect yeah. to like what's the focus. What's, and I think what's really impressive about this this uh, uh, this Behance profile and the projects that are shared are the variety of visual language that is being used. Uh, mm -hmm. There's there's a lot of variation, uh, different usage, exploration, and you can tell that uh, this individual is uh, is pushing the design aesthetic uh, to not be fixed in like one style because that's one thing that sometimes can happen is you kind of get caught up in like a, a style that works and you tend to just like repeat that same style over and over which is it's okay to do that because you're still like it's a, it's your style um, but this is this is also like a really great way to approach your your uh, your storytelling. Yeah, I'd also say like what's really impressive too is that a lot of these case studies are UX focused, mm -hmm. but you could tell that he does have visual design skills as well because of the way that he's telling the story. I think like a lot of times when you're trying to do a case study for like UX, um, you kind of get stuck with like, oh, I have nothing to show. And like, this is like a really good example of that. Like, there are, is a lot you can show and visually tell from a UX perspective. I totally 100% agree because like I think information can be beautiful like the way you you know we, we, we always think about like information um, like visualization data visualization uh, but like being able to take research and synthesis and make it beautiful is a skill and and just even to, to this little animation showing what a prototype like making use of the real estate what did wireframes look like versus final design very smart yeah yeah love the like the tying in like the buddy system with the buddy app uh just a very very uh well-rounded yeah well-rounded concept here i love i love these little outline texts yeah so good good work here kalpesh doing some good stuff out here mit yeah. i wonder i wonder what you're going to be doing in a few years i can't wait to see uh let's look at one more i i'm I'm kind of just interested in this curve. It has some like this, um, you know, some of this, uh, like it's got a different style. Like every one of these has like more, you see, you could see the use case being, being presented. So yeah. curb being able to, uh, minimize the impact of disaster by providing relevant and accurate news to the public. We need this. <laughs> we need this very, very bad. A lot of like a lot of these apps that already exist in the market are a little hard to use, or maybe not like, until, like you know they don't offer you as much functionality as you might need um, and you know obviously we are in the middle of a pretty severe pandemic and being able to offer relevant news that's factual is very important the going into this uh this direction of uh, what was this thing was not skeuomorphic what is it called i'm drawing a blank on the name uh anybody reminded me that'd be great for like the golden ratio for the the way that these buttons look like oh is it like neo neo neomorphism there yeah. right neomorphism neo skeuomorphism something like that something like that yeah yeah it got it got really popular there for a minute and it's kind of fizzled yeah. out oh this is interesting yeah like the, the animation of like it going down 
flow of information. Yeah. Yeah, this is see like playing with a lot of different styles across all these projects is is kind of like showing the connections. This is something that I love to do is like wireframe flows, like wire flows uh, to really just detail out like what are the requirements for each state and each is really cool. So anybody out there uh, who is curious to find a really, really great resource for inspiration and like just kind of tips on, on like what is working well, this is a really great artist to, to watch. Really great. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I made this project while studying UX fundamental, uh, des UX design fundamental courses offered by the California Institute of Art at Coursera. So anybody interested in like taking their, their skills to another level, uh, check out, check out Coursera, right? There's so many different places. If you're, if you're kind of, um, you know, doing these challenges, like you think you're, you're ready for that next step of like getting some sort of uh, more foundational, uh, understanding Coursera is a great place. Uh, so really, really, really amazing work here. Um, let's take a look at one more and then we'll jump in back into uh, what you've got going on. Uh, how about I the could, coffee one? I was going to say the same thing. How many, coffee, <laughs> how many, how much, how much coffee do you drink a day? Okay. So I'm usually good about it. I just drink one cup of coffee one in cup. the morning. Yeah. I'm the same. I'm the same. I drink one. Yeah. I, I can't, I'm, I'm, I get wired by coffee. So like yeah. I, 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 have, I know people that like can drink coffee at like 7 p.m. and still go to sleep. That's not me. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is so using, you know, other tools, but that's OK. We're, we're fine with that sometimes. Uh, interface design, uh, smooth and subtle. So giving you uh, an understanding of like the feeling, the the the, the watching. The, let's look at the prototype and see how this kind of this looks like this looks like it could have been a design challenge. Right. Uh, someone that did a. Uh, one of the design challenges and just like really killed it and did great work with it. Love these animations. Don't even know how you did it. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> really great. Very, very uh, auto animate possibly. Uh, no, this was a different system. So, uh, and then there's a interactive prototype handheld, which is really cool. Uses music, which you don't always have to do. So like simulating the experience, right? This isn't real. This isn't a real app, but that was a, a, like a kind of simulation of like how it could work. So really, really cool stuff here. So please, 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 if you are watching and inspired, give, uh, give a follow to Kalpesh and, uh, you know, follow, follow the work, uh, you know, message if you have questions, uh, interact, engage, uh, do all the things because this is really, really good work here. Uh, so yeah, we can we can hop back into uh, Sarah's work and uh, see what else we could do with the time remaining. I know that we're we're in the midst of a design system build, and I can't wait to see what 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 else we can do with this time we have. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, I think like when we where we left off was just kind of like going over this um, resource for like the design systems repo. Um, just to get an idea of, you know, what are the companies out there doing? What does it look like? Um, some of them are really great where they'll even share the file from whatever um, program they're using uh, as well, which is really cool. So let's see, let's go into one. This is one that I'm going to even take note of because I did yeah. not know about this resource. <laughs> yeah. this, is this is great. So like, uh, for instance, we could go into like the IBM design language, which is like amazing. It's actually one of my favorite ones to go into for uh, data visualization uh, because they break it down um, right. and understanding like when you're supposed to use a certain um, mm -hmm. type of graph or visualization as well. Uh, which is super, super cool. And, you know, I'll probably go into that a little bit tomorrow when we start um, creating the screens for like what what type of data we'd want to see for the app um, to show uh, the nutrients, the sunlight that um, the plant is receiving. Uh, so this one's like a really great uh, resource. Uh, let's see. So 
we can go over like let's look at like the color and um typography for instance because that's what we worked on but yeah so like i said some of them will even give you like the resource like the library that they use uh which is really really cool here they kind of show the palette um which is nice, especially one of my favorite things to do, especially for error states and like a reds like this. Um, sometimes you can go with like a background that's like, for instance, if it's like um, a toaster, uh, you can go with like a lighter background red with like a darker red to help right. with the, the contrast um, and then show like an error state as well. Um, obviously you wanna take into consideration um, somebody who can't see red, so you'd want to maybe either add an icon to kind of show that it's like a negative um, type of interaction. Uh, and then it also goes into development as well. Like how is that being coded? Like, is it being coded with like ARIA standards being upheld and, and whatnot? Yeah. And there is a question um, that like, how do you do something in XD uh, regarding dragging and dropping in features? Like I would explore some of the interactions that you could do for um, using the drag uh, feature and then create another artboard with another state and maybe we can get into that tomorrow. So Nana, if you're available tomorrow, uh, come back and maybe we can make something like that happen and, and on the show. Uh, because yeah, that's definitely a feature that you can take advantage of in the interactions um, for your prototyping with dragging and dropping. Simulating that is cool. We might have that uh, in, in, in your app. Yeah. Definitely. So here, for instance, is the topography that they use with their typeface. They have four different types, goes over all the four weights. Um, cool thing here is that you could test them and see, you know, how does it change? Um, so these are always like really cool ones to look at. Um, it's really nice to like look at the actual like file. Um, so I think we were talking, like you mentioned, for the plugin, the Spectrum one for like Adobe, for instance, um, like we're talking about form fields, they have um, a checkbox one. So you just click it, since it's a plugin, it like just kind of automatically goes in, which is really, really cool. Yeah. Like and sometimes like, have, right, like why, why reinvent the wheel sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it's really nice just because like you can go with like the color scheme. There's like even for the scale um, as well. You have like the different states that you can just kind of switch over, which is really nice. Yeah, and for someone who has work in Adobe's design system too, it it is this is what they use. This is what uh, Adobe designers actually use to build their experiences with Adobe XD. So it's actually like the plugin that they use, which is really cool. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So yeah, like here's like a toast that they have. Um, but yeah, like, so things like this, I feel like I've been seeing that a lot more with like plugins being made uh, that could be used. I know um, Sp uh, Shopify, I believe does that too. Um, for their system as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I will, here, I'll put the text link here in case anybody's interested. Very, very good tool right there. And Peter, yeah. Peter's uh, gonna be uh, hosting our, our next session. So stay tuned for that, for our, the design uh, the creative challenge. Uh, so be, be sure to stay tuned after the show for him. Peter's awesome. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. In inspiring dude, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, um, let's see, we got like 10 minutes left. So we can start just making, you know, some of the, oh, sorry, five yeah. minutes. Okay. So let's just make like one input field. There's so many different ones that you could take into consideration. You could have like, you know, like one line ones. Um, so we'll start with like a regular little square and then
sort of have my and let's use our library Form fields can be like so like people the dependency of like do you put the label above do you put it in the body like there's so many so many different yeah. ways and de depending on the app like aesthetics over functionality are very very you know crucial mm -hmm. yeah and then you know there's always also you want to keep in mind i always like to include <clears throat> like an error state where like there could be like an error message as well. It's usually like the basic bones that I would do for nice. a input field. And I'm not going to create the component yet because like you said, from like an aesthetic perspective, I'm still unsure. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you'll have, you need to have like a multi-line text one or right. just kind of like a free for all, just like a text, huge text box mm -hmm. um, as well. <clears throat> so these are just like the small things that I would account for. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this looks, you can this definitely looks like dive more into this tomorrow. And uh, can we look at real quickly what you've done at the beginning to, to now? Yeah. So we basically kind of went over, you know, what our problem statement is, what the current landscape of like the options that are out there. Um, we went from this mood board to creating um, some color palettes, uh, putting them into our asset library so that we can quickly like swap between them. Um, went into what our typography and our font faces are, and then into type scale as well. Nice. Uh, we talked a little bit about buttons and then started jumping into form fields. And then this is just kind of where it gets like a little bit more nitty gritty and creating mm -hmm. all of those uh, components that you'd be reusing over and over again. So that that way, if you need to change something, it'll be like a really quick uh, change in one place versus having to do it multiple times. So we're almost done building a design system in, in, in this uh, short time that we had. I mean, it time flies. We were here for two hours and it doesn't feel like that at all, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'll definitely, I'll clean this up a little bit for everyone tomorrow and we'll start building some screens just to see how we can actually use some of these components. I can't wait. It's all going to come together. Uh, so for everybody that joined us, thank you for being here. We will be here back tomorrow, same time, 12 p.m. Pacific time. So whatever time that might translate to your time. Uh, so we're here with uh, with Sarah Gear. Uh, thank you for being here. And any last words for our audience today? No, this was a lot of fun. Um, and I can't wait to finish this up with you all tomorrow. All right. Well, stay tuned. After this, you have uh, Design ch Creative Challenge. Want to challenge yourself and create some uh, some cool interactions? Uh, do that there, and then sign up and go to Discord and make sure that you share your work and uh, share the love with the community at large. Uh, so thank you everybody for being here. Can't wait to see you tomorrow. And Sarah, you as well. Yeah, see everyone tomorrow.